The police spent the last two hours interrogating me, and they're leaving now. They think I killed my girlfriend, and so do my parents. I didn't mention the wall walkers, because who would believe me? That's also why I didn't mention the radio. She's been gone for three days now. Everyone at school thinks I chopped her up and threw her under the bridge behind my high school. When I told my friends about the wall walkers and the radio, they laughed. Once they realized Heather was actually missing, they stopped talking to me. Everyone stopped talking to me. People who didn't know me all of a sudden looked the other way when I passed them in the hall. Those who did know me looked disgusted with my existence. What hurts worse than that is my parents believe the police. I remember the night I told them about the wall walkers and that they came when I turned on the radio. When I mentioned the shadows and the music, my dad's eyes rolled back into his head and he took a sip of his beer. Dad didn't care what I had to say. He simply shook his head and left me alone in the kitchen. He couldn't be bothered with childish stories, I guess. But I received the same expression from my mom. Her eyebrows sank and her expression was pure disgust. Though they didn't say it, I could tell they were disappointed in me and did not believe a word I said. I stood by myself in the cold kitchen. I held the radio responsible for all of this in my hand. I think I can bring Heather back, but I need help. Those things which took her, they weren't human, but they were... Uh, I, I can't find the right words. They, they were... I don't know what they were. I just know that when I turned the radio off, they disappeared. I took the battery plate off to remove the batteries and saw... I, I saw... Th there weren't batteries in there. There was something else. I don't know who put that radio in the asylum, but... I, I haven't been able to sleep. I don't understand how the radio turns on without batteries. I wish I had not brought this stupid radio home. It's a Panasonic FR562D radio. It can play AM and FM, and it's from the 60s. There's nothing special about it, well, except that it is obviously haunted, and I think my girlfriend is, is trapped in there. If I turn it on, I can hear her. But then, then the wall walkers come. I'm sitting in my room now, looking at this cursed radio. The moon is high, and the night is cold with chilly summer winds. My parents haven't spoke to me for two days, and I, I miss them. My friends won't return my calls. I hold the radio in my hands and turn it over. The battery slots on the back are open and vacant. I know what I must do to power it on, but if I do that, what will happen to my parents? My hands tremble as I squeeze the radio tight. Why did I have this stupid idea of taking her out to an asylum of all places? An abandoned asylum? Why? Havenbrook Sanitarium was shut down nearly 30 years ago. One maniac kept sticking silverware into the electrical sockets. He almost burned the whole place down. The last thing he did was put the antenna of the radio into an electrical socket and bit down on the antenna. He was fried and it set the whole ward he was in on fire. Avonbrook released a statement that the man in question had a long history of deliriums. He tried to electrocute himself multiple times throughout the years. One thing that stuck out, though, he mentioned there were things walking on the walls in his cell. He couldn't describe them either. I think he saw the wall walkers, and they told him the asylum was built on a graveyard. The bodies had been tilled and then excavated. I spent all of yesterday trying to find that bit of information, but I couldn't find anything. Havenbrook was open on March 23, 1943. Aside from the inmates who went berserk and lost their minds there, I cannot find anything that would suggest supernatural occurrences. It's June 17th. 
1996, and I haven't learned anything about that asylum. What the hell was I thinking? Who in the right mind would think taking their girlfriend there on her birthday is a good idea? It was just meant to be a fun night out. We ate dinner and then saw The Craft. The movie was good and Nev Campbell was good in it, but why not just hide behind the theater and make out? What was it that drew us to Havenbrook? Sure, the place has become something of local legend. Other teens snuck in there and bragged about it at school, but no one ever went there and mentioned a radio. Or, well, the wall walkers. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I am too confused, and I need to make a decision. The radio is in my hands, and I know how to power it. I want to rescue her. I know that when I do turn it on, the music will start. I've never heard these radio stations or the songs this radio plays. I can't even understand them because it plays music backwards. And time, uh, it, it stands still. I noticed this when we first found the radio and I turned it on. I noticed the shadows too. This radio isn't isn't powered by batteries. I take a deep breath and examine the bolt cutter sitting on my dresser. This radio is powered by something else. I set it in a plastic tub and stared at it. The air in the room felt cold and sweat coated my forehead. My bottom lip trembled as I watched the moonlight reflect off the cold steel surface of the radio. A knock against my door broke my train of thought. The door creaked open, and my mother poked her head through the crack. Her eye sockets were dark and heavy, and her hair was frazzled. Who knows when she last slept? Mom said, Brian, we love you, but we're going to my sister's for the weekend. Her eyes darted away from mine, and she looked at the floor. A thin frown pressed across her face as she avoided eye contact. She continued, me and your dad love you, but we need a break. The police, the letters, everything is becoming too much. You'll be okay, right? I am not okay. I haven't been okay since Heather's birthday. I said, Mom, I didn't kill her. I swear, it's the wall walkers. She shut the door and spoke to my dad. I could hear them. She said, he's still going on about ghosts. I don't know what to do with him. Let's just get the keys and go. They rummaged through the hallway closet, collected their things and left. Dad didn't say goodbye. I opened my bedroom door and looked down at the narrow hallway. It was dimly lit and the house was clean. I do not know how long they will be gone, but maybe that's a good thing. Heather's disappearance has stressed us all out, and none of us know what to do. Once my parents left the house, the phone rang. Time seemed to stand still as it rang. I didn't want to answer it. There have been too many people calling and threatening to kill me. Most of them are related to Heather. I don't blame them either. I was the last person with her. I picked up the phone from the receiver and asked who was calling. The voice on the other end of the phone said, You know who this is. You think that just because you were her boyfriend you can do whatever you wanted to with her? I'm her brother, and I can do anything I want to you. I saw that your parents just left. I'm going to give them an hour. If they are not back by then, you might be dead. I already have the gun loaded, and I'm going to savor every moment of destroying you. I hung up the phone. I doubt he's going to follow through with that threat. He's called I don't know how many times. I never should have told my friends anything. These people at school knew about Heather's disappearance before the police did. 
I should have just called the cops when I got home and directed them toward Havenbrook. I'm only 17. Maybe I'm asking too much of myself. I walked over to the curtain and looked outside. Heather's brother sat in a 1982 Chevy Cavalier. The car is blue and hardly drives anymore. He dropped Heather off every now and again, but tonight he's not here for any other reason than to kill me. I pulled away from the curtains, and my mind felt heavy. I wish her brother had not bothered with that car phone. It was a wonderful convenience at one point in time, but now it's just ugh. I don't know how to get these people to understand that I miss Heather too. Yeah, he was her brother, but we were coming up on our six month anniversary. I've never had a relationship that long, and neither has she. Two weeks from now would be our six months, just two. If we were going this strong at six months, I know we could last for at least a year, maybe longer. I've wondered if maybe she's my soulmate, but now I think I'm bordering on delusional fantasy. Either way, I'm suffering through this more than anyone. There are things I know that people refuse to believe. Maybe that's why I brought the radio home. If I could free her, she could tell people what happened, and they would believe her. I would be free from their accusing eyes and dismissive tone. I could return to the football team and reclaim my spot as a defensive back, but I cannot do that with this taint on my reputation. I could have... I, I could have Heather back. And we could pick up where we left off. We could plan for prom in the spring and see more scary movies. I miss her so much and all I want is for her to come back. Now that I have the radio, I think I can make things right. The thing is, I believe this radio has to be played in the middle of the day, under direct sunlight. The reason I think that is because under the moonlight, the radio does, well, it does, uh, the reason, I don't know if the radio acted funny because it was played at night or and it wasn't played in the day I don't know either way playing it under the sunlight might break the prison that keeps Heather or it might play like a regular old radio I plan on returning to the asylum tomorrow afternoon when the sun is highest and play the radio but there are so many details about that night that I can't I, I can't explain the power source of the radio the wall walkers the connection between the two and why why would they need Heather? Why take her? Those hideous things focus solely on her. It's not as though they ignored my presence because they didn't, but they, they were animals on a blood trail. They groped through the asylum and spread themselves across the walls in search of her. They did not relent until they took her. Whatever they were, they moved without a sound until they became something else entirely. I'm searching in vain for words that I, I could use to describe them. Once they ensnared her, uh, no, I cannot, I cannot speak of it. What they did to her and how she screamed, I will not relive that moment, not yet. I returned to my bedroom and examined the bolt cutters on my dresser. I glance at the radio sitting in the plastic tub, and then I sit at the edge of my bed. I open my closet and remove a duffel bag. Once it is spread open, I place the bolt cutters into the bag. There are flashlights in here, and not much else. I also threw in a pack of gauze and a lighter. There are a few shoelaces in the bags, yes. I will need them. I might need them. I don't know. I double checked that I had the battery pack cover and rubbed my cheeks. Before I embark on this journey tomorrow, I must remind myself of the things I've seen. I must. There are hideous creatures stalking me, waiting for me to play this radio. I think it is unwise to turn this radio on and not be prepared. There were small knives in the kitchen. I grabbed them and wrapped them up. 
Once their ends were concealed by paper towels, I put them in the bag. I'm pretty sure those things can be killed, but I'm not too sure. Never killed one before. I examine the contents of the duffel bag and cannot think of much else to add. I have weapons, bolt cutters, a radio. I am as prepared as I can be for this quest. I lay down on my bed and looked at the ceiling. Once I power on that radio, those wall walkers will come. They will be horrifying and they will come for me. I know this because I'll be the only person there. Maybe it's best if I remind myself of what happened that night. Perhaps it would be wise to start this story from the beginning, when our date was coming to a close. The movie was terrific, and I looked into Heather's eyes as we left the auditorium. Her hair was brown and ran to the top of her shoulders. Dimples, small and precious, surfaced with each smile, and right now, she smiled. Heather scooped my hand in hers and then kissed it. I kissed her on the forehead and together we walked out of the theater into the warm summer night. The moon was not quite full yet and her beauty radiated. She wore a burgundy cardigan and the necklace I bought her for her birthday. It, it said I love you in cursive writing. As the moonlight reflected off her necklace, she glanced at it and then looked into my eyes. My heart faltered as I felt a knot in my throat. She placed my hands on her waist and pulled me into her. I held her in the night and hugged her. Across the distance, I saw the Havenbrook Asylum, long since been abandoned for at least a decade. What a wonderful adventure it would be to drop in there for maybe an hour. I remember when a man electrocuted himself at that asylum. He bit down on the radio antenna he shoved into the wall socket and he set his room on fire. No one knows his name or even what he looked like, only that he went nuts and the news went wild with the burning of Havenbrook. The staff were pestered for weeks and that was all anyone talked about at school. I think I was in first grade then. I shudder as I stand across the street from this place while holding Heather's hand. People have died in that building, and many of them were nameless to the outside world. Most of them were abandoned by their families, either because they were too violent or too difficult to live with. No wonder Havenbrook was shut down after the fire. But now, as we stand together, I stare at the abandoned asylum. The lights are still on, but I don't think anyone is in there. It seems strange that a place which has been abandoned would still have electricity, but there it is. I turned away from the asylum and gazed at Heather. Her head rested against my shoulder and she was humming. Her eyes were closed and she seemed to enjoy the moment of us being together. I brushed a lock of hair behind her ear and kissed her forehead. I said, so... Why do you think the lights in that place are still on? Her eyes opened and she looked at the asylum. She drew a hard squint and thought for a moment. A summer breeze fell upon us and the crickets began to sing. We rocked and she shrugged at my question. She said, don't know. Her attention turned toward me. Her eyes were dark brown and she gave a curved smile. She continued, do you want to go over there and check it out? I smiled. How could I not want to check it out? Her hand brushed against my side, and I felt butterflies in my stomach. A smile I couldn't restrain pressed upon me, and my heart raced in my chest. I wrapped my arm around her and squeezed her shoulder. I pulled my attention away from her and returned it to the asylum. The breeze had steadied and created a subtle symphony. As the gales whistled through branches and leaves, air cool and dry pushed against us. Together we stood under the flashing red and yellow glow of the movie theater lights. Once I got over my nerves, I took a breath and said, it's your birthday. What would you like to do? Her eyes closed and she smiled as she said, I'm already doing what I want to do. She pushed away from me and as her smile grew, her cheeks nearly concealed her eyes. She continued, 
I've always been a lady for adventure. Let's go. If other people go there all the time, why not go there now? I wrapped my fingers around hers and leaned forward for a kiss. Her lips fell on mine, and as our foreheads touched, I whispered, I love you. She smiled, returned a soft kiss, and then proceeded to kiss the tip of my nose and then my cheeks. Heather knows that I'm ticklish. Because of that, she kissed my neck, and I couldn't stop laughing as I inched away from her. She held me tight and continued to make kissing noises. After a few seconds, she said, fine, fine. Let's get over there because we only have a few hours. She began to walk toward the asylum and I followed. She began to walk toward the asylum and I followed. I said, yeah, everyone has an asylum story except for us. I scooped her hand in my own and together we crossed the street. A vast field, freshly trimmed, glistened with dew. The scent which lingers after cutting grass still hung in the air. We walked through the shallow field and approached the parking lot. The pavement was dark and gray, and there were potholes peppered around. A few street lights were unlit, while others flickered a soft yellow glow. Mayflies buzzed around the lights. There was one particular owl hooting from somewhere unseen. We stepped onto the pavement and looked at the building. It stood three stories tall, and many of the windows were yellow and broken. The shingles of the roof folded upward, and a gutter hung down one side of the building. I scanned the side of the building in search of a door or window to enter through. There was a road that cut through the parking lot, and at the opposite end of where we are, there's a driveway. I assume this driveway is intended for patient drop-off. There are two doors, both old and brown. After closer inspection, I noticed one door was ajar. We walked together toward that door, and as the distance closed between us, I closed my eyes. Dinner was perfect. The movie was perfect. She is perfect. I felt her tug on my arm. She said, keep walking with your eyes closed and you'll trip. I smiled and opened my eyes. The space between us and the door shrank, and my heart began to race. My cheeks felt cold now, and my hands began to tingle. The excitement and rush of a scary adventure thrilled me, and I believe Heather felt the same. I studied her for a second and noticed her brave demeanor had become timid. Her shoulders were slunk in, and she tapped her fingertips together. Her eyes darted to mine and then back to the door. A smile, once large, had disappeared. Genuine concern had taken hold of her every expression. I exhaled a deep breath and puffed my chest out. I said, Still a lady of adventure? In the most masculine tone I could muster. She swatted at my arm and chuckled. I exhaled and nodded. Heather said, I'm not scared, just cautious. There could be a pack of coyotes or something else in there. She looked through the crack of the doors and continued. Or rabid raccoons. I stepped forward and examined the door. It was a steel door painted red. The paint had begun to peel off and there were pools of rust spreading from random spots. I grabbed the handle and it was cold. Once my grip was firm, I grabbed Heather's hand and I opened the door. The door cried as I pulled it open and we passed through the doorway of the asylum. As we entered, my attention fell onto a vast staircase that rose to a second level. On both sides of the staircase, on the ground level, were two doors. Both had a black screen above the doors, likely elevators which have long since been dead. A thin veil of dust, revealed by the moonlight, draped over us. Particles, too small to arrest our attention, fluttered from heights unseen. The air cool and still clung to us. Despite how mildly warm tonight was, sweat began to bead onto my back and across my forehead. My heart raced and my legs felt weak. I squeezed Heather's hand and she squeezed back. I look up at the ceiling. There are intricate circular designs above us. 
The walls, tinged brown with dirt and yellow with age, had similar molds. Intricate circles carved at the center of rectangles. This pattern repeated itself. The engravings were shallow and not too intrusive. I stepped forward and the rubble from the building crunched under my feet. Heather stepped closer to me and squeezed my hand tight. The feeling of not being afraid felt nice, but I wondered if it would be wise to turn back now. What was there to prove by hanging out here? We came, we saw, and now we had our story. I turned around and faced the doors. Heather said, You're not scared, are you? <laughs> Me? Scared? I'm not the largest guy, but I'm definitely not the smallest. I stand around 5'11", and I'm pretty sure I could fight off most things that would cross our path. I'm not sure what Heather's plan was, but I'm not scared. My heart continued to race as my skin felt cold. I said, me? No. Once I swallowed the knot of ice in my throat, I turned away from the door and walked into the center of the lobby. There were small two-inch holes spread out across the walls, and the ceiling looked as though it was ready to give in. The reception desk was cluttered with fallen debris, and it appeared this debris had sat for a long time. Dust had collected atop it and remained undisturbed. I began to walk toward the stairs, and Heather followed. As I walked forward, I tried not to step on anything. Shards of glass reflected the moonlight shining in through the windows and the dull yellow rays of the lamps which flickered. The buzz of these old lights pervaded the silence and broke the dull tone of the breeze pushing through this place. I pushed my fingertips through my locks of brown hair inside. As we stood at the edge of the stairs, I felt a bit of unease. My neck tensed and my back felt cool now that sweat clung to my shirt. I stepped forward and my legs seemed weaker than usual. Together with her hand in mine, we climbed the stairs until we reached the top. There were two red couches. Both of them were torn apart by vandals and withered by time. Between the couches sat a single coffee table, black but tinged brown because of the dirt which rested upon it. At the bottom right edge of this table sat a Panasonic RF562D radio. I know the model because it's the same kind my dad has. We approached the radio and I picked it up. The radio had a metal casing and it didn't have any signs of rust. I looked at Heather and then down the hallway behind her. It yawned into darkness and its end eluded me. The radio wasn't clean as there were fingerprints and other signs of use on it, but it wasn't as dirty as I thought it should be. This radio was from the 60s, nearly 30 years ago. I turned the radio on and music began to play backwards from it. Silence then came and the voice of a radio host appeared. That also played backwards. I smacked the radio and then it said, they're coming, they're coming. I looked at Heather. Her eyebrows sank as the man nearly sang. He continued, for me, for you. I shuddered as I held the radio. Perhaps the radio is broken and that's why it's here. I cannot play things the correct way, but, but how? This radio takes in radio waves and, and plays them. I don't think it could play these things backwards even if it wanted to. Something off in the distance caught my attention. Leaves hung in the air and they drifted slowly. The shadows surrounding us seemed to grow and I felt my heart beat in my chest. I do not mean that as in I was nervous. I could feel my own heartbeat as though I was getting pulled from my own body. As I looked onward down the corridor, Three fingers, long and skeletal, reached around the corner. While they clasped the corner of the wall, a veil of shadows consumed them. I turned the radio off and blinked. The leaves which hung in the air fell naturally. I wondered, how were they floating in the first place? Did I really just see fingers at the end of the hallway in front of us? 
Once I came to, I realized I stood by myself in front of the coffee table. Heather wandered around in front of me, looking outside. Had she not seen what I saw? My hand shook and my breath became unsteady. I think I just blacked out for a moment. I set the radio down on the coffee table and stepped away. What the hell just happened? The world felt as though it was shrinking and I found that it was difficult to catch my breath. Heather walked toward the radio and picked it up. She frowned and said, I, I didn't think you were going to give me a turn. You listened to it for a few minutes. A few minutes? I only held it for a couple of seconds. Heather walked down the hallway in front of us. The walls were dilapidated and the ceiling sagged. Two inch holes, for some unknown reason, were spread out across the walls, but not the ceiling or floor. The image of those fingers flashed in my mind as we walked into the shadows of the hall. The air became cooler, and the hairs on my neck stood straight up. I took a deep breath in and pretended to be unperturbed. Heather proceeded deeper into the dark corridor. She turned left, walked farther, and took a few more turns. She entered various rooms. Their purpose eludes me. She continued until fear finally stopped her from exploring. Her movement forward stuttered as she entered a small security room and then stopped. She turned toward me, radio in hand, and seemed surprised. She said, I, uh, we can leave now. <laughs> I'm not too keen about this place. I nodded. It's reasonable to believe that both of us are ready to leave. I grabbed the radio and examined it one last time. I set the radio down on the security desk and we left the security room. I looked to my right and saw many corridors leading to mysteries unknown. And I saw much the same when I looked left. I cannot recall how we got here, only that we did. I said, do you know how to get out? Heather chuckled and replied, I was hoping you were paying attention. Um, I don't really know. I turned right and walked down a corridor and Heather followed. The intercom speakers burst to life and the music playing in reverse washed over me. How could that radio have turned on and, oh, uh, I must have set it in front of the speaker microphone. The music grows in volume and Heather begins to whimper. I try my best to remember this labyrinth of an asylum to no avail. Every turn I take seems to lead us away from the exit and deeper into the pit of this asylum. I turn left and entered a small hall. That's when I saw it. There was a vast figure standing on the wall. What it was, I cannot describe. I could not see a head or even limbs. Only the gray eyes of something dark and hideous. It began to close the distance between us as I quaked in fear. As we stood in this decrepit hall, dusk clung to the air. From the dark abyss at the end of the hall extended a single macabre appendage. That's when we encountered it, the wall walker. The skin of this thing was black and seemed to be rotting. There weren't any fingers or even a hand, but a single translucent hoof. It reminded me of a pig's hoof and it pressed against the wall as it appeared to emerge from the shadows. Eyes, gray and soulless, bore into me, and I believe they resembled something similar to a human eye. Their pupils were black and circular, and the iris was gray. There were no whites, only gray. I shuddered and realized that there was a soft melody playing in reverse on the intercom. As I stood, my heart banged against my sternum, the hoof retreated into the shadows, scraping against the wall as it did so. The eyes closed and nothing remained to be seen. Heather turned round and looked at me. Her eyes were wide with terror and her lips trembled as she spoke. She said, what, what, what was that? Brian, please, how do we get out of here? My skin felt cold and a knot I couldn't swallow formed in my throat. My legs were weak and I felt like an animal preyed upon. My voice faltered as I said, I don't know. 
As I said those words, Heather's eyebrows curved upward and a thin film of tears covered her eyes. I, I truly do not know what to do. I returned my attention to the abyss from where the wall walker emerged and saw nothing. How the radio turned on, I don't know. The connection between it and the wall walker, I, I may never know. Heather grabbed my hand and then clung to my arm. The bones in my hand crushed together beneath her grip, and I did not mention that my hand hurt. I have to be strong. I must be strong. I said, I, I, I think that we're seeing things. We've been up a long time today. It's dark, creepy, and nothing's there. The words were hollow because I knew something lurked in the hallway before us. I could not hear or see it, but I knew it was there. I could feel it watching me, staring from the darkness which conceals it, waiting, hunting. We are only prey in its hunting ground. I took a step back and Heather came with me. We can retrace our steps. I took a few more steps back and then turned around. On the floor of the hallway lay debris illuminated by flickering yellow lights. There's rubble on the floor and tiles which have been broken. The walls are marred by peeling paint and doors which lead to vacant rooms are slightly ajar. This hallway yawns onward before us and seems longer than it once was. I look at Heather and her face is contorted in confusion. I believe she feels the same way I do now. This hallway has stretched farther than it originally was. When we walked down here earlier, there were maybe four rooms on each side, but now there are more than 20. Where they came from, I don't know. I glance over my shoulder down the hallway where the wall walker was and see nothing. I look forward and see only darkness and doors. The hallway in which we came from is gone. This asylum has become a labyrinth. And I blame it on the radio. It distorted time when I first turned it on, and now it has created a maze without an exit. The sound of a hoof clopping against the wall reverberates before me. It grows in volume as it approaches. I look down the hall, and now I cannot remember from which end the wall walker was. Both ends now look identical, and as the wall walker approaches, the hallway appears to shrink. I cannot explain this in any other way than a wave of shadows swallowing everything in front of us. I turn around, and this cascade of absolute blackness swallows everything it touches, and from the edge of the darkness emerges a single hoof. As it walks on the wall, the pitch black follows, only revealing its feet. From what I can tell, it appears and sounds as though it's walking on all four, but I can only guess. I look down at both ends of the hallway, and now it makes sense. There are two wall walkers, one on each side of us. Heather dropped to her knees and began to cry. I tried to scoop her up, but she was too wrought with terror. As the wall walkers came closer, I could see more of it. Its arms were elongated and thin. The hooves were connected to something resembling human arms. The skin was black. Everything was black. But more horrifying than that was its face. Two gray eyes were tucked in the sockets of a wolf's skull. The shoulders appeared humanoid, but the head was not. The wall walker did not look like a wolf or even a person wearing a wolf's skull, but it, it, its head truly was the skull of a wolf. A thin layer of flesh draped over it, and it heaved as it crawled forward. Its head was turned so that it was upright with me. As it clopped closer, I noticed something that utterly terrified me. Its focus was on Heather. I turned around, and the other wall walker also paid attention to her. I said, Heather, get up. We need to go now. I slid my arms under her armpits and lifted her from the ground. She wobbled to her feet and her hands trembled as they reached for me. We entered the closest room and shut the door. The room was small and there was a small dentist chair inside of it. Heather stood with her back against the door. I wanted to break down but I couldn't. I must be strong. She said, how are we going to get out? I thought for a moment 
If these things are creeping along with shadows, maybe they don't like light. Is, is there a flashlight here? I rummaged through the drawers, and as I did so, Heather screamed. I returned my focus to her and noticed she pointed at the corner of the room. From the shadows in the corner, an appendage emerged, and with it, a head. A wall walker was crawling out of the wall and into this room. Heather scurried away from the door and turned on the dental chair light and shined it on the wall walker. The creature dissipated as the shadows were washed away by light. That's it. We need a flashlight. There is hope. I searched through the cupboards, and it was then I heard Heather scream once more. I turned around, and she stood against a wall bathed in shadow. Around her waist was the arm of a wall walker, and as she screamed, she was pulled into the black abyss. The shadows embraced her as though it were water, and it splashed as she was pulled in. I had never seen darkness behave in such a way, and then she was gone. The darkness in the room retreated, and I rushed for the exit. I opened it, and the hallway was the same as it was before. The radio continued to play, and the music was distorted, playing in reverse. If I can find that radio and turn it off, I might be able to save her. From my right, I heard her scream. Heather's pleas for help pierced the silence. I looked down the hall and I saw what appeared to be her being dragged through black liquid, but she wasn't on the floor. She was lying on her back against the wall. She kicked and screamed to no avail. Heather was immersed in the inky shadows which dwell there. They followed what I assumed to be a wall walker. As I looked forward, the shadows descended the hall and I saw Heather's legs kick as she fought the creature. Eventually, her feet were swallowed by the darkness, and then I heard nothing. I don't understand. Do these things walk on the walls the same way I walk on the floor? Am I walking on a wall from their perspective? Once I regained my composure, I looked away from where the wall walker was. I examined my surroundings. The security office must be on this level, as I have not gone down any stairs or gone up any either. With a racing heart, I began to run down the hall. What I believe to be a hallway to my left appears. I looked down it, and then looked both left and right. If memory serves me well, I need to walk down this path and take a right turn. The security office should be on my left. I sucked in a deep breath and ran down the path. The shadows return and spread from the corners of this hall. I falter and my legs stutter. Sweat drips from my forehead and my legs throb. Shadows swell across the walls as though they were bruised. I swallow the knot in my throat and run toward the black shadowy mass. It shifts as I run toward it and a limb appears. Two eyes peel open and its gaze falls upon me. I cannot see its face but I can imagine this wall walker looks just like the other ones I saw. After a few paces I approach another doorway. I ran through it, and the darkness spread across the room. Though I couldn't see it, I felt as though the shadows themselves were groping for me. My throat has become dry, and I heave as I search for the security room. I cannot go backwards, because there is a wall walker behind me, and there isn't an exit at the end of this hall. There is only a dead end. I turn around, and a grotesque humanoid body crawls on the wall. This wall walker looks different than the others. Its hands, if I can even call them that, weren't pig hooves at all. They were long, skeletal fingers, and its skin still looked... fresh. I stumbled backwards as the wall walker approached. I noticed it had the head of a pig skull. Those eyes, her eyes, they were gray. They had become gray. This wall walker was Heather. I searched in protest and scurried away from my beloved. The wall walkers took her and made her into this. How? I can see it now. This creature's arms, its body, but why the skull of a pig? I stood up and ran down the hallway, searching for the security room. Heather inched closer and the shadows swallowed her for every second she remained still. Her heaves thrilled me with terror and my hands trembled as I fumbled at the door handles of each door. I rushed farther down the hall until at last I saw the security room. What has happened to my girlfriend? Can I rescue her? 
I want to think about these things and more, but I can't. That's not my girlfriend. That's a wall walker. I steeled myself against the cold truth and entered the security room. The radio sat atop the desk, and it played ghastly music into the microphone. I scrambled towards the radio and tripped over my own feet. As I reached for the radio, I struggled to still my hands. They quivered so much that I couldn't grab the radio. As I stood up, a cold hand wrapped its bony fingers around my ankle. I reached for the radio and grabbed it. Her eyes tore into me, and her stare was something hardly describable. Now that she had lurched closer to me, I saw that only the top half of her skull was that of a pig's. The bottom half was her own regular human skull. Her eyes shifted, and they reflected sorrow and agony. Heather is trapped somewhere inside this wall walker. From the gaze she gave me, she is watching in horror as she lifts me against the wall. I wrestle with the radio in hand and flip the switch off. The music continues to play. It did not turn off. Why? I flip the switch on and then back off. It will not turn off. I turn the volume down completely, but that did not stop Heather. The world seemed to shift as I was lifted from the floor and dragged against the wall. Where it was taking me, I do not know. I beat the radio against the wall, and that did nothing. I kicked the wall walker, and it ignored my feeble attempts to break free. Once I realized that the only way to get rid of this thing was to power off the radio, I immediately peeled off the battery plate. Inside were two severed pinky fingers acting as batteries. Due to the horror of what I'd seen, I dropped the radio and scrambled to grab it. As the wall walker dragged me away from it, I saw the radio drift farther out of reach. Its melody played, and the last ditch effort to free myself from the wall walker, I removed my shirt and flung it at the radio. The radio became snagged in my arm sleeve, and I pulled it toward me. When the radio was in my hands once more, I removed the two fingers from the battery slots. The wall walker disappeared into the empty void. I fell to my side and thudded against the floor. Where was it going to take me? It was Heather there. The whistle of winds passing through trees and crickets was all I heard. The shadows and darkness lifted and what could be considered to be a normal night resumed. A dilapidated asylum remained, and here I was no longer trapped in it. I grabbed the radio and ran away. I believe Heather is either trapped in this radio or the asylum. It's either one or the other. Maybe, just maybe, I can return home, grab some supplies, I can come back and help her. But help her how? Maybe bring some flashlights, some rope, something? Maybe if I expose her to enough light, the wall walker will be pruned from her being. I navigate through the asylum and run away from it as quickly as possible. As I reached the end of the street, I realized I left the... I left the batteries inside the asylum. I have no idea where they are, and... It's okay. Heather is worth it. I will figure out a way to save her. I must save her. I sit on the edge of my bed now. I know what I need to do. The bolt cutters are sanitized and in my backpack. My pack is also stocked with flashlights. Each of them has fresh batteries and I double checked them. Each of them works as they should, and I believe I can cure Heather by blasting her with light. I don't know if she'll disappear into the walls or be purified. The idea is that I will play the radio outside of the asylum under the sun. I don't know if these monsters have a choice or if that radio summons them against their will. I don't know if it will play music backwards or if it will act like a normal radio. The strategy is simple. Tomorrow, I will return to Havenbrook, clip my pinkies off at the knuckle, cauterize them, and then power on the radio. 
Heather is the love of my life, and if I can save her, we can be together again. It only seems right that I fix this problem. It was my idea to go to Haven Brook, and I had the opportunity to turn back. Throughout the course of our relationship, I never pressured her into anything she didn't want to do. I think this is why she trusted me. We both sought adventure that night and found only horror. I cannot relent in this pursuit. I must save her. I miss her, and I need to hear her voice again. Images of her curved smile and dimples etch themselves into the forefront of my mind. Our first date at that same theater, and the courage it took to ask her to homecoming, I, I shook as I looked into her eyes and my voice quivered as I asked her to be my date. She said yes. I nearly leapt in excitement. That night, once held together by the blossom of love, carries me through this moment. I want to hold her again, to be with her once more. That night, when I held her for the first time, I felt a rush of something I had not been able to describe. I could tell she felt the same way. She fumbled over words at the punch bowl, and her hands fidgeted as she held her drink. We were both nervous, and we did not want to appear foolish in front of each other. Together, we overcame the jitters of a new relationship. We grew into something beautiful and wholesome. Together, we shared moments of wonder as we explored forests while hiking. We indulged our love of horror movies, and I held her as she shrieked and looked away. This time, something precious we shared is something I hope for once again. My heart fluttered when she first whispered, I love you, in my ear, and it was then I felt the wonders of love. Now I know why love is indescribable. She taught me that. We shared our first kiss, and now it's your streaks down my cheek. My stomach lurches inward as I am reminded of the wall walker which took her. I swallow a knot of nothingness as I am reminded of her stare. Behind those gray, soulless eyes, I saw her staring back at me. She was terrified, for my own sake. And though she did not say a word, I know she doesn't want me to ever return. I felt that from her... All hope had been lost. There is no cure, and I should abandon the hope of ever trying to rescue her. How could I do that to someone I truly love? I cannot leave her entombed in that horrific beast, to be nothing less than a passenger to her own existence. How, then, do I free her? I beg, how do I release her from the clutches of these wall walkers? And what of the others? There were a few wall walkers. Were they people too, or are they entities that crawled from another dimension? Was that Heather, or a mere distraction? I, I do not know. I drew my attention toward our homecoming photo. Heather, I love you. I will rescue you. I lay down in my bed and looked at the ceiling. The night was calm and quiet. I tried to sleep, and at some point in time... I drifted off. I awoke around 9 in the morning. My parents were still gone and I stood up. It is time. I must do this now or die trying. I picked up the backpack and put it over my shoulders. The asylum is about a two hour walk from here. To prepare for that, I ate an egg sandwich and drank plenty of water. I grabbed a few bottles of Gatorade from the fridge and shoved a bag of corn curls into my backpack. Not the breakfast of a champion, but if I survive this encounter, I can celebrate with a proper breakfast. If I don't survive, then who cares what I ate? I unzip my backpack and triple check that I have everything. I have the mini torch to cauterize my future finger nubs, the bolt cutters, and... I forgot the radio. I returned to my room and shoved it into my backpack. There are six flashlights here. And there's one large one. This will be the main one I use to keep the wall walkers away from me. Okay, I, I don't think I can be prepared anymore. I slipped on a pair of gray shorts and a gray t-shirt. Since this is the middle of the day, I feel as though I would stand out if I wore all black or white. At least gray will blend in with the surroundings. 
Once I checked everything again, I grabbed a gray fishing hat and put it on. I walked toward the asylum and saw far too many reminders of Heather. The diner we first ate at, the park we used to hang out at and spend the night just talking. During the summer, we'd often lay on top of a blanket and watch the stars rise over the sky. I miss that so much. After a long walk, I arrived in the parking lot of Havenbrook. I stood in a kind of stupid stare. Everything seemed so normal and ordinary. It struck me then how quickly and differently things can change. Heather's birthday was only a few days ago. My life, and more importantly hers, had been shattered between then and now. I walked to the side of the building and studied it. I need a spot where it is bright and the sun doesn't have any openings into the building. I walked around it and then studied the placement of the sun. I faced the south wall and since the sun was rising in the east, it would not set for at least 11 hours. This face of the building had plenty of sun and the wall was without windows. If I summoned a wall walker here, it would not be able to retreat into another area in the building. I studied the wall in more detail. There were two shadows at each corner of the wall, more specifically where the gutters hung. If I can get the wall walker to appear there, I can bathe it in light and hopefully Heather will appear. I dropped to my knees and slinged the backpack in front of me. Once I unzipped the pack, I removed the bolt cutters and then the torch. My heart begins to race and my hands tremble. My lungs fill with air and I shudder. I grabbed the torch and ignited it. I tried to steady the torch to no avail. The heat from the torch singes the hair on my fingers and then I set it down. I grab the bolt cutters and slide my left pinky in between the blades. My teeth chatter as I close my eyes and squeeze. I grunt and then aim the torch at the nub of my finger, just above the first knuckle closest to my hand. Once the fire licked my flesh, I cried in agony and set the torch down. One pinky down, another to go. I removed my right pinky and the result was much the same. My hands throbbed as I scooped up my pinkies from the ground. After I dusted them off, I placed them in the radio. The radio seemed heavier now and I struggled to focus on the wall of the asylum. Pain radiated from both of my pinkies and up my hand. I turned the radio on and horrible music played in reverse. I studied the shadowy areas and saw something begin to stir in the shadows. My body trembled as I watched and waited. A face emerged and then two glassy eyes peeled open. It was not her. I looked into its eyes and shouted. I said, give me Heather back. I lifted the high beam flashlight from the backpack and shined it onto the wall walker. The shadows surrounding the monster shrank until all I saw was the husk of a creature pinned against the wall. It blended into it much like a chameleon and it scurried to the opposite end of the building in an attempt to bathe itself in shadows. I followed it with my flashlight and its skin began to blister. Its head, that of a wolf's skull, shrieked. The creature reached into its mouth and withdrew something I could hardly recognize. It threw this thing at my feet and there it lay, a lump of, of mass. I clicked off the flashlight and the wall walker disappeared. I examined the lump of whatever this thing is and realized it was the husk of a man. His arms were twisted and folded over his face, and his limbs were contorted. This man's skin was gray and blistered. I peeled back his arm, and then his face was revealed. This man was the man who bit the antenna long ago. The same man who spoke about the wall walkers. The man who caused Havenbrook to shut down long ago. A wall walker was using his body as a mask. What did these creatures truly look like, if not this? The man rolled over and took a deep breath in. He, he was alive. How? How was he still alive? He coughed and said, they're aliens. That radio opens a gateway between their dimension and ours. We live. He coughed. 
we live side by side. He rolled over on his back and his eyes rolled into his head. His chest stopped rising and I can only assume he died. I looked up at the wall and the creature remained. It split itself in two and the skull of a bear and the skull of a pig gazed at me. I turned on my flashlight and the creature spit out someone I didn't recognize. The person was a woman and she heaved for a moment before she died. I kept the flashlight on it and the wall walker hurled Heather onto the ground. She slid across the pavement and bumped into my knees. Tears streamed down her face and when I touched her she screamed. I scooped her in and held her. She pushed against me and punched at my chest. I said, it's me, it's me. Heather freed herself from my arms and scooted backwards. As her eyes fell on me, she screamed. The expression on her face, the way her lips curled, and the horror in her eyes suggested something was wrong. She screamed, Brian, help. I sat in front of her, but she she couldn't tell that I was Brian. What? I leaned forward and said, Heather, Heather, it's me. What's happening right now? Heather scurried to her feet and began to run away. I stood up and then pursued her. She ran toward the street and I lunged for her waist. She turned onto her back and kicked my stomach. Heather screamed, stop, you're a wall walker. I covered her mouth and tried my best to hush her. Heather's eyes were, were blue, blue. I leaned back. This isn't my Heather. My Heather has brown eyes. She kneed me in the groin and I tried not to flinch. I said, Heather, stop, stop. Stop. I'm not a wall walker. What do you see? She bit my arm. Her nails dug into my cheeks and she pushed me away. I dropped to my knees as she ran. How could she think I was a wall walker? I refused to chase her. I do not know that Heather, and I do not know where my Heather is. I returned to the asylum and looked at the wall. The creature still remained. I aimed the high beam flashlight at it, and from it shot a beam of shadows. I dropped the flashlight, and its beam fell upon my skin. It burned, and I inched away from it. What? I looked around, and... The moon was high, but it, it was day. I searched the sky for the sun, but found nothing. Oh no. I looked at my own arms and noticed that they were elongated. Oh, how did this happen? I, I think I understand now. The shadows were light. The darkness is light. I think I understand. The light from the other dimension is darkness in this dimension. I became a wall walker. I approached the asylum and the wall walker on the side of the building watched me with intrigue. Once I approached the doorway, I searched for a mirror. I realized then the floor was to my right and the ceiling was to my left. How did I become one of these? The wall walker with the pig head approached me. She extended her hand for mine. She said, your blood binds you to us. I know this voice. I looked into the eyes of this creature and they were gray. They were Heather's. This was my Heather. Oh, gosh, my blood. The act of putting my pinkies into the radio turned me into a wall walker. We walked down the wall and together we stood before a window pane. My haunting reflection gazed back at me. My head was the skull of a rabbit and my eyes were gray. Why a rabbit? I turned toward Heather and examined her skull. Why a pig? I said, who was that blue-eyed Heather? Heather shrugged. Whoever that Heather was, I think I freed her. 
As for my Heather, I hold her hand, and together we stand, watching the light grow on this bright day.